As the U.S. approaches a Thanksgiving like no other, the CDC is urging people against travel to see their families. This is because America has reached yet another grim milestone. As of Tuesday, about 88,000 people are currently hospitalized for COVID-19, and it's the highest number the nation has ever experienced. Chelsea Walsh is a traveling crisis nurse who moves from one COVID hotspot to the other. She is serving those hardest hit by this pandemic, and here she is talking to our Hari Srinivasan about what she's learned along the way from Texas to New York. Thanks, Christian. Chelsea Walsh, thanks so much for joining us. First, let's just start out by, give us a tour. Where have you been in the United States this year fighting COVID? Too many places. Uh, New York, New Jersey, Arizona, Texas, and I've been in a couple states in between traveling. These are literally the worst places in the United States of where these cases were spiking. You went to the worst places on purpose. Yeah, um, I knew that people needed help and I wanted to help them. Uh, the hospitals in New York, it, we saw these images of absolute exhaustion on the faces of nurses and doctors. They seemed so overwhelmed because we were still learning so much about what was happening around us. Compare that to, say, whether you were in Texas or in Arizona. This is months later where we knew a little bit more. The support really came down to the hospital supporting us. It came down to leadership supporting us. It came down to the community supporting us and listening to us. And then when that stopped, it was probably the biggest shock um, to is mainly always wondering why, you know, nobody was listening to us. Why all of a sudden we didn't have a voice anymore. Yeah, and I think a lot of people struggle with that idea. I mean, especially New Yorkers. Look, we've lost 26,000 people to this, in this city, in this region. What part of this do you not understand is real? Now we are at a point where 10 times as many people, Americans have died from this, we have 12 and a half million infections. Why is it that when you went to Arizona or Texas, how could these folks not realize that it's real? That's the thing. Right now, in being a nurse in 2020 is like being a meteorologist and telling everyone, hey, there's a lightning storm coming. Lightning can hurt or kill you. Lightning can hurt or kill your family if everyone ends up in the hospitals at the same time. We may, may not be able to take care of everyone. And then everyone else screams back, we don't believe in lightning as they run directly into the storm holding metal rods. So how do you convince people who don't believe in lightning that lightning is real? That's kind of where it kind of comes down to. You know, um, I, I wanna ask also about a clip that you recently had in the Wall Street Journal, you and a few other crisis nurses sort of cataloged and uh, made diaries of your day. I have to put one more tube in. Here's my hand. Oh my God. Oh my God. Like, why is there so much blood? I don't know. She's the IC. She's gonna bleed out. She's a full car. She's a full car. happens again, I'm not going to be a nurse anymore. I'm not doing this. I'm not dealing with this. Whatever that was just in the room with, I don't want that. I don't want to die that way. Oh my God, it was so bad. It was so horrifying to watch. I don't know why she was bleeding so much. whatever that was. What was happening in there? Pretty much a younger person uh, came in with COVID as the only thing that we knew that she had. And uh, she started bleeding profusely out of her nose, her eyes, her vagina, everywhere at the same time. Um, and in that moment, you don't know if they're gonna live or die. And then in that realization that this is something that's contagious, you don't, you realize that after you walk out of that hospital today, you might die. And that's something 
fairly rare that happens? Yes, it's a rare complication, but unfortunately it happens. When I personally see patients like this that are young, that are typically healthy, don't really have a medical history that end up ventilated or have heart attacks or strokes from COVID, you see them lying in the hospital bed and you realize that could be you, that could be your friends, that could be your family. And you walk away just thinking, when is it gonna be my turn in that bed? Oftentimes you as a nurse are the last person that some of these people see before they die. And you're the one that's left to tell a family, often over a cell phone or a FaceTime video, that their loved one has passed. Well, what is that process like to do over and over and over again? One of the hardest things I've ever had to do. You watch people you develop a bond with because neither of you can go home to your families and you live with them pretty much because you're there all the time. You develop bonds with these people and then you watch them go. It's like watching new friends die. And then you talk to the families and I've had to talk down so many panic attacks. I've had to convince so many people the virus was real and that's why their family has passed. Then you can't even hug the family when they get in there most of the time. And you, some people, you get off the phone with them or you see them after they leave the hospital and all you can think of is that person's gonna go kill themselves. Because a lot of the times the family members are who are the people that give it to the person who died in the hospital. And the guilt that they end up having from that event is so significant. And yet you can't really even say something to them, squeeze their arm in the same room because they're not there with you. I mean, this. This sounds like the stuff that you take home that you don't tell your loved ones about, about when they ask about, hey, how was your day at work? This is what you are not talking about. And if you're not talking about this, if other nurses aren't talking about this, if other doctors aren't talking about this, what does this do to your psyche? Um, well, I have therapy once a week now. <laughs> um, it, well, I have PTSD and um, I have COVID PTSD. A lot of nurses are now developing it. We all talk about it all the time. A lot of us are talking about how, you know, we're getting away, we've gotten away from bedside nursing and a lot of people won't go back to bedside nursing. They go get therapy now. A lot of, a lot of nurses, they had to start taking medication. Um, we deal with panic attacks, we deal with crying spells. We, because we do care about people and we did, we didn't get into this job to watch everyone around us die. And now that is our job. That's not what we signed up for. Being a crisis nurse, you're used to going into places where they're short staffed, where they're super busy, where something intense is happening. Perhaps it's recovery from a natural disaster or something else. Why was this so different? It was different because a lot of these places don't have the support staff anymore. They've all quit or been fired. Um, it's really mostly just doctors and nurses on the ground floor. And in some places, the doctors won't even help in these rooms. They won't even go into these rooms. It's still left up to the nurses. And we felt from the very beginning, most of us have talked about this, that we've pretty much been sacrificed, um, that our lives were deemed less than everyone else's from the beginning by being told that only we were allowed and no one else was allowed to go near these patients. So there's a constant fear of why us? And again, when is it gonna be our turn in that hospital bed? Um, there's also the fact that, you know, we don't have the PPE and we don't, ha we don't have the supplies that we need. In some places, it's felt like a third world country where we're running out of medications we have to ration. We're running out of supplies we have to ration. We're running out of staff we have to ration. And then the nurse to patient ratio, which is what keeps a lot of patients safe by limiting how many patients a nurse can have, um, that's going up, which is bad because that means we have less time to spend with each person and let, we, can, we can't watch everyone at the same time. There's a lot of very risky, dangerous things that have happened and are happening um, that make the entire situation very unstable and very unsafe right now. That's, that's why it's so different. Historically, there's always been a little bit of uh, tension between nurses and doctors, but the best systems are usually when they work together well. And, what has COVID taught you about what needs to be changed 
in the role of what a nurse does. Right now, I think the primary focus hospitals should have is to protect their nurses. Because if we're not there, we're gone, there's no more hospital standing. Because without us, there's nobody to do the skills. And these hospitals are already turning into these ghost town-like situations where there's already not enough staff for, to take care of a hospital. And we're doing our best. In some places, I've had to be housekeeping. I've had to be the secretary. I've had to be the phlebotomist. I've had to be the pharmacist. I've had to do every job in the hospital because nobody else is working. And then the doctors still won't go into these rooms. And so we have to do doctor's assessments. So nurses are literally picking up all the fields that are leaving the hospital. And if we're gone and we're not protected, these hospitals can't stand. So right now, main priority hospitals should have is focusing on protecting their nurses because we're keeping the hospital standing. So <laughs> Chelsea, someone watching this is going to say, we've had Anthony Fauci talking about this. We've had so many people, so many doctors, so many experts saying, wear a mask, socially distance, wash your hands, use common sense. Why is it that we're also hearing nurses tell us about patients who are literally dying without believing that they have the very thing that's killing them? Because everything became politicized. Politics invited itself to medicine and it divided everything. It was never supposed to be like this. And if people want to know who to listen to, listen to your nurses and doctors that are actually working with these patients. Because we know what's going on every day, and we actually do care about everyone, and we don't want everyone to end up in the hospital or get sick. Like, we know the consequences of what happens if the hospitals get overwhelmed. If anyone wants to listen to anybody, listen to us, because we care about everyone. And guess what? We hate masks, too. We don't want the economy to go down, either. We hate doing all these guidelines, as well. We just want this to be over. So if anyone wants an unbiased opinion, ask your nurse or doctor. I also want to know, how do, you, how do you not get sick if you walk into hospital after hospital where COVID is running rampant? That's the thing. I'm about due to get sick again. So, yeah, uh, you meaning, uh, meaning you've been sick before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's been a few months at the very least. And uh, I've had a lot of nurse friends, crisis nurse friends, who've ended up with the virus two or three times, and on their second or third time, they end up in the hospital bed, uh, some of them on a ventilator. So I, I just, uh, I'm just hoping that that's not me the next time around. How do you keep your families from getting sick? I don't go near my family. When the last time I saw them, I couldn't hug them. I haven't hugged uh, anybody in a long time. I haven't really been able to embrace my family at all. It's hard. When you really crave human support and it's not there and you can't have it, I understand that's really hard for everyone right now because we're going through it too. Um, but we're doing it, again, because we care about everyone and we want to keep everyone safe. So we do this alone. <laughs> Now, to be clear, you don't work for a specific hospital that you're on staff of or anything. So, I mean, are you basically working for like the Uber of nursing that sends you to wherever surge pricing is? Yes. Um, you're an independent I, contractor. Correct. What's your health insurance like if you're going into these places and getting sick multiple times? I don't have health insurance. I have had health insurance since May, June. Uh, so I can't go to the hospital <laughs> if I get sick. I, uh, there's a lot of nurses right now who don't have medical coverage and we continue to work. There's been a lot that has been going on in medicine and I personally don't believe it's fair to, to nurses what's happening. Um, we are not being covered if we catch COVID in many cases. In, in a lot of cases now too, we're often being terminated from the job because we can no longer work. And we can't prove that we got it from the hospital versus the grocery store. So they let us go and they hire another nurse to take our place. So since you're an independent contractor, you don't have to have health insurance to do the work that you do, even if the work that you do puts you in harm's way. Correct. I don't think most people will be able to wrap their head around the idea that a COVID or crisis nurse working in COVID units is doing so without health insurance 
And if she got sick and was in a hospital bed next to that patient, she might very well never be able to pay for it. Um, that is the reality we are now living in. So why do it? Well, because everyone needs help. And it's not like I can do much else to help anyone else right now, other than my job, even though it feels like it's on fire most of the time. So I continue to go back to work, and every now and then you have those patients or those families who say they, they really appreciate everything you're doing and that they love that you are a part of their life, that you really made a difference, and that helps you keep, to keep going. And then you see these young ones, the ones that don't make it, and then there's more that do. And when you see them walk out the door, it gives you hope that maybe things will get better. Maybe people will get better. And then the next one will roll in the door. But uh, it's hard. It's very, very hard. And I don't know how much longer any of us can keep going on at this rate because we're getting burnt out. We're getting tired. We're getting frustrated with all this. We're almost at our last limit. I, it, it feels like society's been pushing the rubber band to see how far it can stretch. And that rubber band's just about to snap. They may, America, it's very real possibility right now that America may be left without hospital systems in many places because many of the nurses will walk out or leave and they will refuse to work in certain conditions. You know, we have a lot of families that are getting together for Thanksgiving right now uh, against the better advice of public health professionals who are traveling to do so. And I wonder if you can tell them perhaps a story of a patient that you've dealt with that sticks with you that might resonate with them as well on why they should take this seriously. I've got a lot of patients. <laughs> um, I, have, I guess I'll tell you about one more recently, a young gentleman who is healthy, got COVID from the gym, continued to go to the gym with COVID, ended up having a heart attack and um, got placed on a ventilator. Then there's also um, the mother who got COVID from her son and ended up dying. Um, there's the mother who got COVID from unknown places, but came to term nine months pregnant, had the baby in the ICU. Uh, the baby ended up passing and so did the mother and it left a couple children orphaned. Um, I, I, I've seen so many different scenarios play out in real life. And I don't know how to prove to other people that this stuff happened other than you had to be there or you have to trust me. Or are you just going to wait and find out and experience it yourself? And that's something I can guarantee you nobody wants to go through. Nobody. Chelsea Walsh, thank you so much for what you do. Um, I sincerely mean it. I hope you stay healthy. I still hope you stay safe. Thanks so much for speaking with us. Thank you.